In 2015, the Qatar national football team finished 13th in the AFC Asian Cup, which is the CONCACAF Gold Cup equivalent for the Asian Football Confederation. To make matters worse, they had a negative five goal differential throughout this competition and failed to advance past group stage, losing to the likes of Iran, Bahrain, and the United Arab Emirates, which let's face it, and none of those teams are really considered world beaters. But let's now fast forward to 2019 and Qatar wins the same competition with a positive 10 goal differential, defeating the likes of UAE, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, and in the final, Japan. Well, the best word I can say, but uh, we'll describe this was boom. <laughs> so what happened? And what can we expect from Qatar in the 2022 FIFA World Cup? What's up guys, this is Brian McDonough and welcome back to another episode of State of Soccer. Subscribe, smash that like button and sit back and relax because today I'll be discussing an unfamiliar opponent, Qatar. I think it's best first to address the story of this Qatari team. For context, we won't go as far back as their first ever international appearance in 1970, but rather we will focus on the present day, an era that I have dubbed as the Felix Sanchez era. On December 2nd, 2010, it was announced by the disgraced former FIFA president, Sepp Blatter, that Qatar would host the 2022 FIFA World Cup. Fast forward six and a half years later, on July 3rd, 2017, and the current head coach of Qatar, Felix Sanchez, would be hired. Since taking over in 2017, Felix Sanchez's record has been 36, 10, and 16, which isn't bad for his first senior team gig, but it hasn't always been such smooth sailing for Qatar, with Sanchez at the helm. As solid as his record indicates, in 2017, he would go 4-6-2. And, and following some player personnel changes, in 2018, he would improve to 7-3-2. But in 2019, he would shock the continent of Asia, winning the AFC Asian Cup. So that leads me to the next question. How is this possible? How did Qatar, a country of only 3 million people, defeat the likes of South Korea, Japan, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE to claim the title? Really, what I'm asking is, how did Qatar get so good in such a short period of time? The answer lies in Qatar's player pool, a selection of players that has drawn a great deal of criticism from other AFC teams, and even for some, acquisitions of corruption. And here's why. The 2019 AFC Asian Cup Final starting 11 for Qatar only featured four returning starters from the 2015 edition. So of course, many questions were asked like, where did these players come from? And the answer to that question is a complicated one. My alma mater, Georgetown University, recently published an article on this very topic titled National Identity in the Qatar's Men's National Football Team. And this article dove into the makeup of Qatar's team. When Qatar won the 2019 Cup, 14 of the 23 players were naturalized Qatari citizens. In other words, they weren't born in Qatar. They were immigrants. In most areas of the world, this wouldn't be such a contentious topic, but with Qatar's most recent success and being awarded the 2022 World Cup, many questions are being asked about the Qatari Football Association and how they conduct their operation. In a sport where nationalism ties often run supreme, especially in the AFC, Qatar has been criticized for feeling a team of immigrants. But what difference does it really make? What I'm saying is that despite the animosity towards Qatar suiting up far more players, isn't their current team a true representation of Qatar in present day? A Qatar that is rapidly expanding through means of globalization? Let's be honest, farm born players have always been a huge part of the United States men's national team over the years. In fact, there's actually a Wikipedia page dedicated to that list of players. So let's rein it back in. What does this have to do with the success of Qatar? When it comes down to it, Qatar born or not, these players are really good. And to make matters even more intriguing, this team is made up of solely players representing the Qatari Stars League. In fact, if you look closely, every player in Qatar's roster not only competes in the Qatari Stars League, but the majority represent the league's best team, Al Saad. To me, this means that these players are used to not only playing with each other, but also against each other. And the entire 23-man roster playing in the Qatari Stars League is bound to create a sense of cohesiveness. Teamwork make a dream work. In 2018, CONCACAF and the AFC entered into a strategic partnership. This partnership between both governing bodies was strategically formed to grow the sport of soccer in both areas of the globe. And referee exchanges and best practices surrounding the hosting of major events is meant to support both governing bodies as the 2022 World Cup 
and 2026 World Cup in the USA, Canada, and Mexico quickly approaches. When this partnership was established, Qatar was not only invited to the 2021 Gold Cup, but also the 2023 edition. So this leads me to my last question. Is Qatar actually a good team or are they playing better than expected? When Qatar won the 2019 AFC Cup, it was a surprise, but not a miracle. As I alluded to earlier, the team has improved a great deal over the past half decade, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the budding success of Qatar's youth system. In addition to the 2019 AFC Cup, Felix Sanchez also led Qatar to win the 2014 AFC U19 Championship. Four years later, Qatar would make it to the semifinals in the same tournament. We all know that Asian Football Confederation isn't UEFA or Ball, but it does have some formidable competition. At this rate, if Qatar continues to improve as rapidly as they have in the past couple of years, then I wouldn't be totally shocked if they advanced at a group stage at the 2022 World Cup. This team's no joke. The Qatar national team is a formidable opponent. The team represents a growing nation, a rapidly expanding economy, and a growing narrative that certainly drums up well-deserved controversy in terms of the nation hosting the World Cup. But one thing is for certain, Qatar has entered the room. So that does it for this week's episode of State of Soccer. If you enjoyed this video, then smash that like button, subscribe, and if you have anything to add, leave a comment below. If you enjoyed this episode, then make sure to stay with us because over the next 32 weeks, we will be profiling a different World Cup team each week leading up to the FIFA World Cup in Qatar. See you next week for next episode.